Hi, good morning everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us today. We are going to discuss about Need for Speed. While it sounds like a Hollywood movie title, we are uh, discussing about organizational speed, the need for which has never been greater. So as a recent example, if you think of pandemic and organizations who stick to maybe BAU or business as usual, uh, as usual ways of uh, working, primarily to deal with their customers, manage their suppliers or vendors, more importantly, to collaborate with their colleagues, or for that matter, for getting anything done. So they would have certainly failed. On the other hand, if you think of organizations who quickly increased the speed of decision making, adopted new and innovative ways of working, more importantly, leveraged technology and data to scale up a speed and scope of uh, innovation, they not only survived, they thrived. So it is quite intriguing to understand what is that uh, secret ingredient which is common in all these organizations that stood out. So to understand this, there is no one better than the man sitting uh, right in front of me. So he built a global FMCG giant, India Fortune uh, 500 giant, grounds up from the scratch, always known for uh, running the company with highest standards of corporate governance and professionalism, attracted the best of the talent throughout the journey of uh, Marico, more importantly known for very, very agile and uh, fast-paced decision making to accomplish very difficult tasks to achieve positive outcomes in a very record time. So welcome, Harsh. Thank you, thank you, Chaitanya. It's so great to have you uh, with us today. Uh, welcome to TechHR 2022. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Harsh, uh, uh, what is quite interesting is you built a very, very uh, fast-paced organization known for very uh, speedy decision-making as well as execution, more importantly, at scale. So what is, how do we create operating model for speed? So let me go back to the pandemic which you started from, and I think clearly we saw that when the pandemic happened, the normal cycle times for developing vaccines was anywhere between eight to 10 years. And many of my friends in pharma industry said that all these promises of vaccine companies coming out with a vaccine within one, two years is all absolutely humbug. It can never happen. But what really happened was a miracle, you know. Uh, and why did it happen? And I was just wondering, I think first of all, it was a global problem very high rewards, very high stakes. There was a big purpose in saving lives and so much cooperation amongst all the stakeholders, whether internal or external, and the government backing it, uh, taking very high priority organizations, putting their best resources to resolve this. And what we saw was amazing. So in a way, pandemic has accelerated many trends. And this trend for agility, which was there in the environment, has really got accelerated because of the pandemic. And organizations have realized that if you have to succeed in a fast-changing environment, which has so many of disruptions, discontinuities, it's important to move with speed. So how do organizations move with speed is, is a big, big challenge for most organizations. And the starting point is, I mean, there is always a trade-off between perfection, excellence, and agility. I think the key thing is to find the right sweet spot. In, a, in an airline business, if you're developing airplanes, you can't afford to not to have perfection at the cost of agility, but there are many other businesses which, beyond a point, if you try to be totally perfect, it may take much, much longer period of time. It may add marginally to the overall quality of work you're doing, but you're losing out on time. So I think the first thing the management should realize is that where do you draw a line between perfection, excellence, and agility? And at that sweet spot, just move ahead, even if it is not 100% perfect, as long as the business is not going to get impacted, like a safety issue in an airline. I think the second thing I want to say is the top management behavior. The top management has to give the right signals of agility. You know? That mindset starts at the top, but the biggest challenge for top management is how can it filter down all the way to the bottom? So I think that's a very big challenge that leadership has to realize that, that the whole organization should be 
thinking of agile and speed and not just the top management. And some of the things which Marico did in the last few years, we, over a period of time, uh, most organizations uh, develop newer processes with change in leadership. Some new processes come in, the old processes continue. And uh, many times these processes add a lot of value, but sometimes the processes are so cumbersome. Uh, there is a need to relook at all the processes, uh, whether it is uh, a goal setting process, a goal evaluation process, or uh, incentives management or supply chain, and say that how can I simplify that process? What processes can I drop which have become ancient? What processes can I do in a manner which actually condenses and takes much lesser of management time and which would release a lot of time in the environment? What processes can I, can I do it through automation? So I think it's very important to relook at all the processes once in a few years, not every year, and change them so that a lot of time of management gets freed up because some of the processes will just get eliminated or get simplified. Having said that, I think the culture of the organization plays a very, very important role in driving agility. As I said, it starts at the top, but a culture which is very open, which is very transparent, where there are no boundaries. If I am a marketing person at the middle level, and if I have an issue with the manufacturing at the middle level, I don't have to go to my boss and my boss goes to the head of manufacturing and goes down. I can directly interact with the person in the manufacturing. So I think you need to create the level of trust within the organization that anybody can interact with anybody else. And it is based on trust. And if my boss feels that I'm doing it in the interest of the organization, that uh, it is done based on trust, he would encourage me to do that. So that would reduce a lot of unnecessary, uh, shall I say, time spent in, you know, going through different levels and hierarchies and things like that. I would say a flat organization structure also is very important because a flat organization structure ensures that things move with speed. But a flat organization structure has to be backed by very good quality talent. You know, if your quality of talent is not good in a flat organization structure, because the organization is flat, there is a higher degree of empowerment and delegation in a flat organization structure compared to a far more hierarchical structure. If that empowerment results in not good work done at the lower level, then the boss will say, how, how can I empower a person when that person is not capable? So the organization to invest in talent building, in through job rotation, through quality of talent, through training, so that the persons who are manning that role, they are empowered to do much more than a similar role in some other competing industry. So empowerment would play a very, very important role. I would say trust, boundarylessness, openness. I think these are all triggers for moving fast. I've seen in many organizations that, uh, you know, there are because of lack of openness, there is backbiting, there is gossiping, and people want to find out who, whom, who, which leader should I back so that I can get promoted. You want to eliminate all that. You don't want an organization which has all these politics and you know, and I think it's a difficult task to do, but if you invest in a culture which is open, trust-based, boundarylessness, it's very much possible. And that's what we are trying to do. Culture building is easier said than done. You can arrive at values, but how do you convert those values into a culture is a bigger challenge. I think you need to reinforce those values on a perpetual basis. For example, if I want to build an open culture, how does an organization create an open culture? So we, in Marico, what we do is we have an open house where anybody can ask any questions across the organization at all the locations. We send all our leaders to a training program which promotes open. It's a six-day training program. We go out with the teams once in two years talking about how open is our relationship. And it's just not with the boss and uh, the subordinate, but at the peer level also. So we have an open office. So when you s tackle openness from different angles, you create an open culture. And tomorrow, if a leader comes in who has a different style of leadership, which is not open, 
it will just come out. There will be lots of pressure in the organization to ensure that that person is open. So a autocratic leader will never be able to survive in Maricom because of the culture we build. So I think the culture part is, is very, very crucial. And then if you have a certain project, I think you need to ensure that you need to create teams which are tackling that project. For example, the vaccine development project or anything else which are new product development or new factory establishment. In our case, I'm giving you an example of many years back when we wanted to launch ERP in the organization. And normally the tendency is that you give your functional team to look at ERP part as a part of their job. What we did was that we selected very good high quality talent across functional talent, put them in a different location. Their only job was ERP implementation. So we removed the so-called escape button. I had my own normal job to do, so I couldn't do that. And everybody was the same location, a different location away from, and they didn't have anything to do but ERP implementation. And we implemented, installed ERP within a period of nine months, and completely error-free. We got some awards from SAP also for that. But what I want to say is that when you identify certain critical projects which you want to do it in a certain good manner and in agile manner, you have to remove escape buttons, you have to form a task force, you have to announce it within the organization that it's, it's good that I'm a part of the task force, it's, it's recognized. There have to be rewards for achieving that, that task in addition to normal rewards and the recognition also if the task is achieved well. So when you look at all these things, you are driving agility. I'll just give one more example on, um, on in the pandemic. So we are very digital savvy and everybody at the middle senior levels are digitally savvy. Everything, I mean, everybody has a laptop at even at the middle level also. So when the lockdown happened, I think we were the first company within three or four days to go into production supply chain because everybody was interacting with each other through digital means, through, and it's boundaryless. Everybody interacts anyway with each other. It's not a culture where the boss goes on supervising and tracking what each individual is doing. So everybody is empowered, and the speed with which we moved was amazing. We were able to encash on the opportunities available in the marketplace because of, of this culture. And many a times our distributors were closed because some area the shops were closed, and we were able to do all that in spite of a total lockdown for, for those two, three months in the month of, I think, March uh, 19, whatever, yeah. 1990. Huh? Okay. So these are some of my thoughts on, on agility and speed. And, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Ash. I mean, um, uh, so you talked about uh, balancing uh, between uh, perfectionism and agility. Uh, it's, it's quite applicable to every industry and every uh, function, uh, so uh, in product as well. So getting that MVP right, we always struggle. What is that minimum viable? So you know, people take you know, years and years to uh, deliver uh, MVP. Yeah. So the tenets of the culture is well, uh, very, very uh, well said. Uh, so leadership and culture, obviously, they go uh, together, yeah. right? I mean, end of the day, people uh, who execute are responsible yeah. for uh, culture, uh, it's leadership. Yeah. So uh, getting a, a top talent uh, is not easy, especially yes. uh, if you reflect on your journey, yeah. so probably, uh, the beginning, uh, maybe the sector was, or uh, the brand was not very, very lucrative, while you know there were very large FMCG companies, etc. But you know you successfully uh, hired very good talent. So uh, how could you do that? Any any learnings? So before I answer that question, uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier was the role of technology. You know, I think you're a technology person, so I don't know how I've missed out on that. But I think technology plays a very, very important role in driving agility. So if you are doing a new product development. Everybody should be aligned what is being developed, whoever is involved, and they have to be aware of what's happening on that project on a, on a daily, hourly basis. And if there is a bottleneck which is impacting speed, it has to get highlighted through technology route. So I think it's very important to create that, and the biggest problem comes in an organization, cross-functional issues. So you have to have cross-functional alignment and ensuring that cross-functional coordination is not delaying your agility for your projects, you know. So we have, for example, we, in, we are in a branded consumer goods company, so normally we have our plastics vendors, 
making plastic bottles and then we have uh, vendors for manufacturing and packing. We have our own factories, then the, f the goods go from factories to depot, depot to distributor, distributor to retailer. So in our supply chain technology initiative, the moment a distributor supplies, and we have like, I don't know how many SKUs, 200, 300 SKUs of different brands. SKU-wise details of what each distributor has supplied as well as what the distributor has stock. And we have some stock norms. So moment that stock norm is achieved, then a trigger goes off that, okay, now this distributor will require the next order of this particular SKU. It goes to our depot. Depot will again looking at the stock. Do we have stock or not? Moment they are going automatically, a trigger will go to our manufacturing units that this is going to come. And this comes from all the distributors across India, 600 distributors. And then from there, it'll go to our packaging vendor that, okay, we will need this bottle. So online, automatically, every day you would know what is going to be required to be manufactured. Yeah. And I think that is only possible through a technology uh, initiative. Yeah. Yeah. So now to answer your question about uh, attracting talent, I think today there is a war for talent and that war for talent is going to accelerate in the coming years. I'm just presuming that everything will be back on the Indian economy and I'm quite uh, hopeful about that in spite of all the discontinuities about COVID and this war and all that. But net-net, I'm saying India is in a sweet spot in terms of growth. If you look at that, I think that war for talent is just going to accelerate. So it's, if you are a head of HR, it's going to be a big, big task. And we've seen that in the last uh, one year about the resignations and attrition and things like that. So it's very important to recognize that there is a war for talent. And that war for talent is as important as war for market share, war for growth, uh, war against competition. So I think the top management has to realize this is very, very high priority issue for the organization. Having said that, I think it's very important. Uh, of course, you need to analyze why attrition is happening and multiple causes. I'm not going to the routine causes, which I'm sure all of you are aware. But the key thing is, I mean, what is that unique thing you are bringing to the table? What is that employee value proposition which your organization is is doing to ensure that not only you are able to attract, but also retain talent. And that culture plays a very important role. If I am giving a culture where there is much lesser stress because of no gossiping, backbiting, politicking, then to that extent I am enjoying doing my role because I'm spending all my energies in performing rather than managing all these unnecessary things which are required in many other organizations. If the culture is a culture of job rotation, then I'm learning. If the culture is a flat culture where I get promoted. Um, so a combination of good overall atmosphere in the organization, opportunity to grow, opportunity to learn is very, very crucial. And the quality of leadership, of course, will play an important role if you have an open leader and you know, ultimately they say the employee stays for the leader. And if you combine all that, then ability to retain is, is equally important. But I think you need to capture that. What is unique about you in the job market? And you need to go on leveraging that, not only amongst your headhunters, but to the potential employees. When they join, uh, yes. they have to realize that this is unique. And there has been a lot of effort which has gone into building this culture. We also use a lot of our, we also have attrition, for the example, in spite of the culture. But uh, the biggest advantage we believe is that all our ex-employees are our brand ambassadors. We are in touch with them on a regular basis. And many of them have joined us back. But many who want to join us, they would want to refer about the company to our ex-employees. And when these brand ambassadors give a very good review of the organization, it's relatively it's easier for us to attract talent. So I think that to stay in touch with your ex-employees is very crucial. We have called them to parties to celebrate when we reached a 5,000 crore turnover and next year we'll call them with a 10,000 crore turnover celebration. All our ex-managers and I think it's a great occasion to to be in touch. Many of them have joined us back at, at different levels, many over a period of time, but I think it's, it's very important to maintain, connect with them through IT or whatever else. Yeah. Thanks, Harsh. I mean, um, so quite interesting, um, when we talk about HR technology, we used to say, you know, hi to retire technology. So now, you know, that retire so the technology scope you know, won't, ha won't end with the uh, retirement or exit. Yeah. Later also you need to keep engaging them, alumni management, that's all very, very critical. It's a yeah. continuous process. So uh, uh, one thing I would uh, 
love to understand uh, your perspective on in this scheme of things, continuously evolving uh, landscape. So what is the role or future direction of uh, HR function, especially your expectations from <laughs> CEO I think, CXO yeah, I think unfortunate that in Indian entrepreneurs, they don't, they don't, the mental mindset is HR is at a lower level compared to some other function. That's really sad, you know. I really get angry and I tell most of my friends, HR has to be at a similar, at a senior level than many of your other functional heads, you know. It has to be a part of the management team. You can't say that HR is one level lower because HR is playing a business role they are able to offer business solutions. When they have to select a person, they understand, if they understand the business, they, they are able to visualize what kind of a person will fit in and yeah. be able to add value. I'll just give one more example. When uh, I started Marico in the year 1990, the first recruit I took was H head of HR, the first recruit, because my biggest challenge was I had to recruit about 30, 40 senior and top managers. At that time, the business was earlier managed by a family managed company where my father, my uncles, four of my cousins were a part of that. So the perception was it's a family managed organization. When Marico was formed, I was the only person in charge of Marico from the family. But you can't do away with the perception in the job market. There is a fear that if there are seven family members, I don't want to join that organization. It's a family managed organization. So I had to overcome that. So, so I had to sell my story to the HR head. Now me talking about this versus he talking, it's a big difference. So he, when he talked about this, it had a far more impact than me talking. So he was batting for me, ex Asian Paints, very well networked in, uh, in, uh, in the job market at that time. Okay. So I think that was a very good decision and that really helped us get senior talent within a very short period of time. And I mean, he was assuring them that this company is going to go professional, it's going to transform. Uh, because he was convinced by my story when, when I recruited him. And a few years later, I'll just give you one more example, how HR can add value to a business. So in, uh, I think around mid-90s, we wanted to establish a new factory. And normally you do an analysis of where is the most profitable location in terms of which state, uh, which part of the state. And it so happened that we, we make coconut oil, parachute coconut oil, and a lot of coconuts are grown in Kerala. So Kerala on paper was the best location in terms of cost structure, taxation. But when I discussed this with my family, my friends, all of them said, don't make the mistake. Don't go theoretical in terms of going to Kerala. You will burn your fingers on paper, it'll look good, but the industry relations climate is so bad there that half the time your factory will be shut. So my head of HR at that time and head of operations they said, you give us a chance. We will break this, this image of Kerala being so negative about IR. And we will do things in a different manner. But you have to back us. So I said, how are we going to make it different? So they came with a proposal saying that the biggest problem in, in um, most cases is that for the laborers, there is nothing to do after work hours. They spend eight hours in the factory and after that, there's nothing to keep them occupied. It's an idle mind, which is like a devil's advocate. And then that's how the trade unions come in and they start doing all these strikes and you know. So can we select talent, which is good talent from good families? So they went to their houses at a personal level, met their parents, parents, and also assured them that we will keep your children occupied beyond office, beyond factory hours. So we divided the factory into four different houses, like schools. And we had lots of activities like sports, culture, art, and created internal competition. So every day after work hours, a person could actually spend two, three hours doing these kind of things, which brought joy to them. And we also had an internal job rotation program because you don't want the same laborer to do the same work on a daily basis. In addition to the culture part, we, for first 10 years, we didn't have a union in Kerala. We have hardly had any problem and the financial benefits, I don't even know, maybe it'll go to 100 crores, 200 crores. Now that is the role HR played, you know. So we are not understanding what role HR can play in driving business, you know. Yeah. Thanks, Vashem, I mean, that's quite uh, insightful. Before I proceed to the next question, um, if anyone in the audience 
if any of you has any question, uh, it's, it's good. Hi, sir. My name is Mohit and I represent Nielsen. We work quite closely with you. Um, you mentioned that uh, an organization can easily go about removing some of the redundant practices. Could you give us an example or two of some of those uh, HR processes or yeah. anything that you worked upon redundant? So we had a very detailed goal setting and goal evaluation process. Very, very detailed. It would take two months at the beginning of the year. We would have a media review, which will take again one month. At the end of the year, we'll again have a uh, evaluation and we just condensed it uh, substantially. Um, so I think that reduced a lot of organizational energy in driving goals. Uh, so again, perfection versus agility was the principle we used. Sure. I'm just giving you one example. I, this study was done about two years back, but I'm sure many other processes were looked at and also not only uh, eliminated or simplified, but also automated also. You, you want to ask a question, right? Yeah, please go ahead. So uh, when you spoke about culture, and you know that when you mentioned that how a leader will not, you know, with an autocratic style, will not survive in your organization. Uh, so what do we do to really, you know, uh, do something about culture where there's a lot of change happened at the leadership level? Like the leadership is not stable. How do you drive that change? So I think culture building is a quite a complex process. I can speak on that subject for next one hour, but uh, I think I have written a book. You know, I don't know how many of you read, but uh, I think the book is available here. Uh, there's a whole chapter about 30 pages on culture in Marico and how I build that culture. I, I can assure you will learn a lot from that, at least from that chapter. The name of the book is Harsh Realities. It's, uh, it's been there for last time. It's got very good reviews. But net-net, I think a, a lot of things are needed, as I mentioned earlier. If you want to create a culture, you need to perpetually reinforce values. So the value of openness, trust has to be reinforced so that people down the line if somebody is doing it differently, it'll just come out, you know, uh, in an open culture. So there'll be a lot of pressure uh, because if somebody is behaving in a different way, either through subordinates or peer level, it, that issue will just come out in a highly open culture. I'll just give you an example of trust. Trust is a very important value for us. So what does an organization do to drive trust within within the organization. So you can say I'll trust, but you need to have visible signs of trust. So from early 90s, we have done away with master signing in office. We've done away with casual leave and sick leave because we believe that we trust you. If you are sick, you're sick. You don't, there is no entitlement of casual or sick leave. We, each employee maintains their own leave records. We have done away with uh, authorization of expenditure which are incurred on behalf of the company. Normally the tendency is to go to the to your boss and get it authorized. And why do you want to do We trust you. You can self-authorize your expenses as long as they are fitting in certain organization policies. So these are very strong signals you're giving to employees that the employees, that the organization trusts you, you know. So that's how you create a climate of trust. So when a new employee comes in, many times they get surprised that we have not seen something like that. And this is going on for the last 30 years now, more than 30 years. So uh, maybe uh, one, uh, uh, can you quickly touch upon how do you uh, efficiently and effectively design the work to uh, the? work, maybe you know, to reduce the <laughs> burnout. It's a very, very uh, all prevailing so First issue. of all, burnout happens when it starts with your own mind, you know. I think it's that work-life balance to me, that subject doesn't resonate <laughs> with me. I think if you love your work, you will not have a problem with work-life balance. Having said that, I think organization is responsible to ensure that every day people are not working 14 hours a day. There will be certain periods where there will be some work pressure. So but it's okay. I think you need individuals who are self-motivated and who are not complaining type. You know. These days more millennials are wanting more and more work-life balance. But I think a lot will depend on the, on the design of the organization, the structure, the empowerment levels. And ultimately, if you are self-motivated and if you like Doing your, if you enjoy doing your work, I don't think you'll go on evaluating continuously the issue of work-life balance. But ultimately, if, as far as I'm concerned, I, I believe strongly in focus. Do a few things, but do them well, because focus leads to depth, and depth leads to excellence. So you need to tackle a few things. You need to prioritize. And then I empower a lot. I delegate a lot. Sometimes I've done it, overdone it, and sometimes I suffered. But net-net, I'm OK, because that gives me a lot of space. I have never sat in my office beyond 536 in my 
total career, you know. I, different ways of handling stress. I sometimes, most of the commuting time in the car I'm working, either on phones or finishing some reading. So that time otherwise goes waste, you know. Yeah. And even I do crazy things like when I'm sitting in the gym with uh, cycle, with a backrest, I'm reading papers and things like that. So you have to find some unique ways of resolving some of the issues. Thanks, thanks a lot.